Okay, thank you. Um, and I'd like to thank the organizers for inviting me and organizing this uh, workshop. It looks really, really interesting. So I'm looking forward to the next few days. So I'm going to talk uh, about, well, actually a subset of my abstract. This I decided my abstract was perhaps too ambitious. Um, so I'm going to talk about internal wave generation in the presence of background currents. So this is all two dimensional. They're not actually eddies. They're just background currents in one direction. And my arrow key doesn't work. Just have that. Okay. So just a brief outline. So a, sort of an introduction and some theory about uh, internal wave generation in the presence of cross ridge currents. So this is you know generation by you know tides going back and forth over a ridge with a current uh, up near the surface. So a bit of theory and then some numerical simulations focusing on cross ridge currents with a, either a linear stratification and then a little bit about stratifications with a picnic line. And then if there's time, I'll show some results for our, a long ridge or a long shelf currents and localized PSI, parametric subharmonic instability. So theoretical and numerical work to date has largely assumed a quiescent background state apart from the barotropic tides. So here I'm going to consider mainly the effects of a surface trapped current lying above a ridge on internal wave generation. So here's sort of a schematic showing the setup. So an arbitrary stratification and an arbitrary current that lies above the topography. So the current itself is not flowing over the, the ridge and generating waves. All the wave generation is due to the tidal currents. So I've got an isolated topography with a Fourier transform and it's all two dimensional. So some assumptions in the theory so small topographic amplitude compared to the water depth, small tidal current, so U naught is the tidal current. Um, F is equal to zero in everything I'll do today, except the long ridge stuff if I actually have time for it, and a single tidal constituent. So the governing equations, just non-hydrostatic and viscid with a boost and esque approximation, and as I mentioned, no rotation. So just note that in here, P and rho have been scaled by the reference density rho naught. And the theory is a straightforward extension of Katawala to arbitrary stratification and the inclusion of a background current. And so far, the theory considers the discrete spectrum only. The continuous spectrum is not being considered. And I'll briefly talk about what those two things are if you're not uh, familiar with them. OK, so theory. So first of all, the horizontal current U is separated into three parts. We've got the tidal current, which is a function of time. We've got the background surface current, U bar of Z, and then U prime is, of course, the perturbation associated with the waves. So switch into a reference frame moving with a far field tidal current, so U tide. Um, so I get a new horizontal variable, psi. And so my tilted variables are functions of psi, Z and T instead of X, Z and T. So in this reference frame, the bottom is moving. So it's at Z equals minus H plus H tilde of psi and T. And you linearize the governing equations and you end up with a set of equations. So the, the tidal current has disappeared except in the boundary condition. Uh, so the boundary conditions are at the bottom. So in particular, W t tilde at the bottom, right? We've got U tide of T times some H prime, right? Which is psi, so or psi plus the integral of U tide. So it's more complicated, right? You've got uh, no normal flow at a moving boundary. So we can introduce a stream function, psi, and right? you know, the vorticity equation. Um, so most of you, I'm sure, are familiar with this. If we take the Fourier transform with the bottom boundary condition, where did I get this expression involving uh, Bessel functions? And this is W at the bottom. And so the bottom is at minus H in linear theory. And based on this uh, expression for the, uh, for the vertical velocity at the bottom or the Fourier transform of it, right, you look for W hat, Right, the Fourier transform of W as a function of Z with the same form. So it's equal, same as the previous equation, but I've just inserted a W hat N of K and Z. Okay, so this gives you the vertical structure. 
Okay, and W hat N is zero at the surface, so that makes W hat zero at the surface. And then W hat N is equal to one at the bottom, so then the, uh, the bottom boundary condition is satisfied. Well, this leads to the following expression for W hat N. It's a phi N of K and Z divided by phi N of K and minus H, where phi N is a solution of a standard eigenvalue problem for linear internal wave modes. Okay, because of the background current, right, we've got division by N omega, so that'd be the nth harmonic of the tidal uh, frequency, right? So it, Tidal current has frequency omega. It's going to generate waves with all the harmonics n omega as up to you know equal uh, up to the point C frequency. So we've got this eigenvalue problem subject to oh, sorry subject to these two surface conditions, right? So I don't have two conditions at the top and bottom. Right? I've got phi n of k and zero is equal to one, and phi n prime of k and zero is equal to one, sorry, phi, what did I say? Phi nk of zero is zero, right? So the surface uh, boundary condition is satisfied. And then its derivative is one at the surface. Okay, so then we just solve that uh, differential equation. So it's just got these initial conditions, you know, step forward from the top down to the bottom. So you get phi n. And then divide by the value at the bottom to get w hat. Okay, so we've got W hat, you stick it into the expression for uh, W hat, right, and take the inverse transform and we get this very nice complicated equation. Okay, so here the top equation is just repeating the same one. So I have this integral, and this integral has poles at the value of k for which phi n of k minus h is zero, right? So I've, I, you can see in the expression we're dividing by phi n of k and minus h. Okay, well, those poles correspond to the standard, you know, vertical eigenmodes that uh, those of you who have studied internal waves should be quite familiar with. There's a discrete set of values of k, okay, and these give the discrete spectrum. Okay, so there's two sets, right? One, one's for waves propagating to the right, and one's for waves propagating to the left. So that's the discrete spectrum. Uh, well, the ODE has singularities at type Z, where n omega minus u bar Z times k is equal to zero, or if I divide by k, right, this is at heights where the phase speed of the wave is equal to the background current, okay? And if that occurs, right, then you've got singularities in the equation, right? You're dividing by zero. And you've got a spectrum of values for right, all the k such that cn of k lies between uh, the frequency n omega divided by the surface current, since in this case, the surface current is the maximum current and zero, okay? So the inverse Fourier transform does include all these k values and this gives the continuous spectrum. So there's two parts of the solution of this inverse Fourier transform. Right there are the discrete modes, which are the standard internal wave modes that most of you are familiar with. And if there's no background current, that's all you have. But if there's a background current, then you've got a full spectrum of waves with phase speed lying between, say, the minimum of the background current and the maximum of the background current. Okay? And so that gives you uh, the continuous spectrum. So just a little bit about uh, Critical layer, so the, the continuous spectrum means there's a critical layer at some height or a critical level. So that's the height where this condition U bar is equal to C is satisfied. And if you think of ray tracing, if I, if I start with a packet of waves um, you know, down well below um, my critical level, they have got this dispersion relation, the wave packet propagates up. So as it propagates up, Right, the background current is increasing. So I've got a wave packet, it's got a uh, rightward phase speed, got a current to the right, and the speed of the current is increasing as you go up. So if you look at the dispersion relation, on the right-hand side, I've got U of Z times K is increasing. K is fixed as the wave packet goes up. Only M varies, well, and, and the background fields U and, and N. So as U of Z times K increases to keep the frequency of the wave constant, 
right? The square root of n squared over k squared plus m squared has to go down. And the only thing that can, well, so assuming, for example, that n is constant, right, that means m has to increase. And as u times k goes to omega, right, so the phase speed is equal to the current, right, m has to go to infinity. And that means the vertical wave num wavelength of the waves goes to zero. Okay, so you end up with a situation where the neglected terms, the nonlinear terms, and the viscous terms become very important. So if the viscous terms become important first, you've got what's called a viscous critical layer. Um, but as the wave approaches the critical layer, the, uh, the group velocity goes to zero, so all the energy piles up, the amplitude of the wave increases as well. Okay, so the not neglected nonlinear terms can become important before the viscous terms become important, and then you have what's known as a nonlinear critical layer. And uh, as this packet approaches the critical layer, right, theory will predict that some energy is absorbed, some is transmitted, some is reflected. Okay, so now a bit about uh, energy conservation. Um, so if you take the governing equations, you can derive an equation for the conservation of energy, okay? So EK is the kinetic energy and EA is the available potential energy. <clears throat> So I've got you know the rate of change of the total mechanical energy plus you know the divergence of the energy flux is equal to zero. Okay, now U is in this case uh, split into two pieces. You got the background current U bar plus U tilde, right? The perturbation due to the wave, and W you've just got the perturbation due to the wave. So the kinetic energy, right? It's a half. Um, so remember, I've divided everything by rho naught, so there's no you know, density term in these, these expressions. The kinetic energy, so you've got a half, you know, u squared plus w squared, but u again is u bar plus u tilde. Okay, so I square that, I get a half u bar squared, so that's just the kinetic energy of the background current. The last term, right, I've got a half u tilde squared plus omega tilde squared, or w tilde squared. Okay, so that's the kinetic energy of the internal waves right in the reference frame, right, ignoring the background current, but there's this cross term, u bar, u tilde. So I've got EK zero, which is just the background kinetic energy. You've got EK one, which is of order one in the perturbed fields, and then EK two, which is quadratic in the perturbed fields. Okay, and then we've got the available potential energy, which is quadratic in the perturbed fields. So I can define a perturbation kinetic energy, EKP. It's EK1 plus EK2, right? EK0 is independent of time. It drops out of the equations. So now let's let E bar be the perturbation energy in a Lagrangian subdomain. And by a Lagrangian subdomain, I mean a domain that's oscillating back and forth with the tides, okay? So in a reference frame fix with the topography, the Lagrangian subdomain is oscillating back and forth. In my reference frame, moving with the tides, it's fixed. So if I integrate over this domain, right, I end up with you know, the energy equation. So the time rate of change of the total mechanical energy in the domain is equal to, well, I've got fluxes of energy leaving the two lateral boundaries. And then the conversion term G, which is you know, what's generating the waves, right? That's the due to the topography oscillating back and forth. So the energy fluxes, there's a kinetic energy flux, an available potential energy flux, and then the work term, right, the integral of U times the pressure. Well, let's look at the work term. So this is the one that uh, without a background current, it would be the dominant term. So you've got the integral of U times P tilde, but U is background current U bar plus U tilde. So I've got two terms, W1, W2. And W1 is order one in the perturbed, in the perturbed quantities, right? W2 is second order, okay? And W2 is the, the only one you would have if you didn't have a background current. Now, if you imagine expanding your perturbations in some power series in terms of some small amplitude parameter epsilon and tidally average the work term, you would find that you end up with a uh, order epsilon squared. The leading term is order epsilon squared, but there are two parts to it. 
So first there's what you get from you know standard linear theory, just the average of you know P1, U1, right? The leading order pressure and horizontal current perturbations. But because of the presence of the background current, you've got a second contribution. So it's the background current U bar times the time average of the second order pressure perturbation. For the kinetic energy flux, again, you remember the flux is, uh, if I go back, um, right, the flux you've got U time, the integral of U times EK, and EK is quadratic in U, so the flux is cubic in, in the velocities. So I've got four pieces, right? I've got you know the integral of a half U bar cubed. I mean, that doesn't matter because it's spatially constant. Okay, the flux out the right is balanced by flux in the left. And then you've got a three halves U bar squared U tilde. So this is order one in the perturbed fields. And then you've got a piece that's second order in the perturbed fields, and then a piece that's cubic. Okay, so KF zero, one, two, and three. And again, if you imagine expanding in a power series and powers of some small amplitude parameter, you find that the tidally averaged kinetic energy flux right, is second order, so order epsilon squared. And there are a whole bunch of terms. The first one, you've got 3 halves u bar squared, so the square of the background current, times the background, the, the mean, uh, the second order mean current associated with the waves. And if you know background current, that current would be gone. And then you've got a u bar z times, right, which the kinetic energy flux or for linear theory. So you've got u bar z times, you got a three halves u1 squared and a w1 squared. Okay, so lots of terms here. Without a background current, right, this would all the order epsilon squared terms would go. Okay, so point here is that so without a background current, uh, linear theory would predict the uh, energy flux is dominated by this work term, just the average of p times u or p1 times u1. With a background current, you've got an order of epsilon squared uh, contribution to the energy flux from the kinetic energy flux. So no background current, you can forget about the kinetic energy flux, but with a background current, right, you need the kinetic energy flux. Unless, of course, the background current is you know, very weak. Okay, so now I'll show a few results. So the first set of results, they're all dimensional. Um, so water depth, 5,000 meters. You can see below the schematic, the current is sort of fairly accurate, but in this set, the density field is linear. So rho is, a, is just a linear function of Z. Okay, bathymetry, a Gaussian, right? M2 tidal frequency with a tidal current of five centimeters per second. Okay, so if you calculate the vertical eigenmode, so the, the discrete spectrum for the leftward and rightward propagating waves, you can see there are very different properties. Okay, so for the leftward propagating waves, right, the eigenmodes have, right, these oscillations in the bottom, near the bottom, whereas for the rightward propagating waves, right, the oscillations are in the top path, in the current, okay? Just look at the right panels, which shows the vertical structure for U, the horizontal currents, okay? The left panels are for W. Okay, so here, is a comparison of the nonlinear simulation with theory. So the upper panel shows the results for from the nonlinear simulation after I believe it was 10 tidal periods. And the middle panel shows the theoretical prediction and you see it agrees very well. So for the theoretical prediction, right, you've calculated all the different eigenmodes and you have the amplitude of them all, right? You can calculate uh, the velocity perturbation for all of them. And for each of those, uh, you, because the theory is for, you know, a steady state, you know, uh, periodic solution for the theory, you take each mode and you just, uh, you put an envelope on it. So first mode extends, you know, to the left and right, the distance that, you know, those waves would propagate in, you know, 10 tidal periods, right, with the, whatever their group velocity is. And then the mode two waves, they don't get as far because they've got lower group velocity and so on. 
So in the theory, um, each of the modes, the uh, contribution from each mode is sort of enveloped so that it only extends the distance, those waves would propagate in 10 tidal periods. So you can see excellent agreement. If you look to the right of the ridge, which is at zero, so it's very small here, up near the surface in the current, you can see this sort of fan-like structure. And it's, okay, thanks. So it's very similar in both panels. Uh, the bottom panel compares the surface currents in the numerical simulation with the surface currents in the, um, the theory. So excellent agreement. Now, if you look at the tidally averaged energy fluxes versus distance from the ridge, you get, well, I was quite surprised at this when I first saw this. So if, to the left of the ridge, so here the dominant terms are, are the red, so that's the work terms. That's what you get from linear theory without a background current. And then the green is the kinetic energy flux. And you can see they're of comparable size, right? I mean, the kinetic energy flux is about half the, the work term. The blue is the available potential energy flux, so it's actually very small. And then the black is the total, okay? So you can see that the total energy flux so the ridge is at zero, it's the right side of the, the upper panel. And as you go to the left, right, you can see the total energy flux is almost constant, but the contributions from the kinetic energy flux and the work term oscillate quite a lot, okay? So if you pick one location, say X equals, or X over H is minus 20, you'd see you know, relatively small, uh, almost no kinetic energy flux. Right, and if you go to X over H is minus 30, you say you've got quite large energy flux and a correspondingly large increase in the available, or sorry, in the work term. On the right side of the ridge, right, the structure of these uh, terms is very different, okay? You don't have this sort of periodic oscillation in the, that you see in the work term and the kinetic energy flux to the left. And then, here, this is comparing the energy fluxes predicted by theory with the nonlinear simulation. So if you look at the upper panel, these are the fluxes to the left of the ridge, and all the fluxes are rightward fluxes, so the fluxes to the left of the ridge are negative. If you compare the red curve, which is from the simulations, with the blue curve, which is first-order theory, you can see there is quite a difference. And these are fluxes as a function of the width of the ridge, okay? So all the ridges are subcritical, and for the narrow ridges, there's quite a difference between the two results. Okay, so the theory does a good result, a good job of predicting the currents, but for narrow ridges, it's not doing a great theory, a great job at predicting the uh, energy fluxes. And so differences include in the theory, um, not including the second order mean currents, for example, and uh, and of course we're not including you know critical. Uh, the continuous spectrum. So I think I will maybe just very briefly skip through to something else. Um, so this is um, results using a uh, stratification uh, that's not linear. So it's got a picnic line. So the left panel shows the density field. There's a picnic line, lower layer, constant N, and then upper layer, you know, reduced stratification. And these are non-dimensional, um, so water depth one. Um, so you can see this shows the horizontal currents and you can see asymmetries in the leftward and rightward propagating waves. This is with a stronger current. And if I can stop this. Okay, so I can see over here to the right of the ridge, there's some breaking, some overturning. Um, now, if you add a mean, uh, uh, if you add a background barotropic current, so the right panel here shows a background current with a small barotropic component. So I've got a current that goes all the way down to the bottom, right? Instead of being zero outside the upper layer. And in that case, so the top panel is with UG equals zero, so no barotropic component, and the lower case is with this, the, with this weak uh, barotropic component. And you can see the results are actually really different. Um, so this 
the beam that goes up to the right gets spread out and split into a sort of fan-like structure. And it changes the breaking and mixing quite a bit. Um, so I guess this is kind of hard to see in this light. But in the upper right, that's with no background current. And so we've got, uh, where's the cursor gone? OK, anyway, you can see some overturning at about x equals, say, 8 and z equals minus 0.15. OK, with that weak background current, that disappears. Um, and I guess because of this fan-like structure, so it's spreading out the energy flux. And I think I should probably stop here, maybe a few points to summarize. Uh, so I've derived in some analytic expressions for the internal wave field. Um, eigenmodes have to be computed numerically. The current makes leftward and rightward fluxes different. And so I didn't talk about this, but the fluxes in one direction can be, say, eight times larger than fluxes in the other direction. And it varies, depends on the width of the ridge. So for wide ridges, the downstream flux is larger than the upstream flux, but for narrow ridges, the opposite is the case. Uh, kinetic energy flux is very important, and that, of course, would depend on the strength of your background current. Uh, fluxes from the mean second order fields are also important. Um, so background sheared currents create asymmetries in energy fluxes, the types of waves, and also wave breaking. So it's enhanced in the downstream direction. And adding a vertically uniform current to a surface current spreads the downstream internal wave beam and seems to reduce breaking in the big decline, at least the cases I've looked at. Hey, and I better, better stop. Sorry.